Jesus is the great reverser of human values. When he says, many who are first will be last and the last first, he's not talking about resources, but the conventions by which we've come to rank people and rate what's important in life. Who's number one? He challenges us to consider the possibility that what's most treasured in this age will prove to be relatively worthless in the next. I can illustrate this with a video my son shared on Facebook this past week. Anybody seen this one? You, you put the cell phones in the blenders? Here we see a man in a lab coat with two blenders. He proposes to compare two top-of-the-line smartphones, an iPhone 5 and a Galaxy S3. His value subverting question is, which blends best? Then horror of horrors, into the blender they go. You see them, you see them getting knocked apart here, ending up being poured out in fine little bits, a pile of particles. Seems almost an obscene act to destroy valuable marvels of technology thus. Surely to a person watching from the third world, it must seem unthinkable. As for guys who enjoy blowing up movies, they'll probably watch and say, cool. My son's response when he posted it, I think I'll buy a blender. <laughs> Amazed, astonished, jaws dropping open, that might be our response to such a video. That's how people around Jesus responded when they heard what he had to say about how unvaluable this world's goods are in light of eternity. Kingdom values shred what this world treasures into teensy little pieces. God offers something far better than the latest smartphone, but it comes at a cost that might stop us in our tracks. One day as Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem and the cross awaiting him, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him, Mark tells us in 10.17. Now piecing together the accounts in Matthew and Luke with Mark's, we come to call this man the rich young ruler. Verse 22 says he had great wealth, that's rich, Luke calls him a ruler, possibly a leader in the local synagogue, ranking right up there in the regional who's who. Mark says he ran up to Jesus. This guy's on the move, a go-getter, perhaps a local mover and shaker. I like to run from the car to the post office and on other errands too. I hate wasting time. I want to get on to the next task. If you feel life's busy or you're caught in a rat race, perhaps you'll identify with this fellow. He seems positive, successful, an opportunity seeker. And so far, it's paid off. He has many possessions, more toys than the next boy. He may not quite be flattery, but he seems to have had some PR coaching for his initial presentation. <coughs> Jesus is very appealing. He kneels before him, asks not just calling him a typical rabbi, but it said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now immediately Jesus checks him at his first word. Jesus isn't susceptible to flattery, if that was the young man's intention. In fact, he seizes upon a relatively inconsequential greeting to steer the whole conversation in the direction of examining ultimate values. Verse 18, Why do you call me good? Jesus asks. No one is good except God alone. Let's look at your value system. What's your frame of reference? Is, is it God-based or from an earthly viewpoint? Jesus might be subtly implying, do you consider me just a teacher or maybe more than that? Jesus doesn't say he's not God, but there's enough ambiguity in his response to get a person wondering if he's suggesting he's something more. Before the conversation is over, he'll be implying he's one who, if you want to follow him, you'll have to give up everything you have. Verse 21 refers to treasure in heaven. Jesus' aim is going to be to help this young, upwardly mobile success story to determine what it is he really treasures, what his heart's core values are. Who is Jesus to you? Do you suppose he's just a good moral teacher? The documental evidence of what he claimed doesn't leave that door open to you. He claimed to be the Son of God, to be given all authority in heaven and on earth, to be Lord, to be our final judge. 
There have been many wise philosophers and teachers throughout history, but Jesus confronts us with a claim on our obedience that surpasses any other historic figure. A good teacher just doesn't cut it, doesn't go far enough. <clears throat> Jesus goes on to help the newcomer evaluate his life from a long-term view. If he's interested in eternal life, like he says, is he a worthy candidate? In verse 19, Jesus offers a quick summary of six of the Ten Commandments that have to do with human relationships, perhaps using defrauding as a corollary of covetousness. He says, you know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Matt pauses a moment and then professes innocence. Verse 20, teacher, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Give him credit. Check, 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 check. His behavior had conformed ideally to the external standard. This guy was a keener. Perhaps he could have said with Paul in Galatians 1.14, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age. I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Like Paul, he could consider himself, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. A rabbi's dream candidate to take on as a disciple. Anybody got a blender? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus does take this man very seriously. He detects real sincerity and searching in this person kneeling before him. He knows the fellow's zeal for the law and determination to be religiously obedient. Verse 21. Jesus looked at him and loved him. New Living Translation. Jesus felt genuine love for him. Then he added, one thing you lack. The young man is a success story, religiously and commercially. He's got it all together. His high school yearbook lists him as most likely to succeed in his whole class. He's making it in the synagogue system as well as obviously making it in the business world. Just look at those threads, that bling. He's a veritable poster boy of rabbinic Judaism's theory that godliness brings worldly success. You see, the prevailing attitude among Jews at that time was that wealth was a token of God's special favor. Some sections of the Old Testament feed into this philosophy. The book of Job. You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. And after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. Psalm 128. Blessed are all who fear the Lord and walk in his ways. You will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. Isaiah 3. Tell the righteous it will be well with them, for they will enjoy the fruit of their deeds. So, wealth was viewed as a blessing from God, a reward for being good. Unfortunately, some preachers today present a prosperity gospel in which trusting Jesus guarantees that whatever you lost in the recession, well, you'll get back again, and more besides. So wealth was seen as implicit proof that a, a person had obtained God's favor. Also, it was felt that uh, riches gave a person an advantage in obtaining eternal brownie points. Rabbinical teaching gave the wealthy a, a clear advantage for salvation. And see, according to the Talmud, with alms, as things you give to poor people, with alms a person purchased salvation. So the more wealth you have, the more alms you can give, the, the more sacrifices and offerings you can offer, thus purchasing salvation. Uh, at least in theory. I was listening to John Piper in a sermon. He was uh, talking about the proportionate generosity of the rich and the poor. He is pointing out that the state in the United States with the lowest per capita income is Mississippi, and the state with the highest per capita proportion of giving in the United States is Mississippi. Yeah. And here this ideal student of Judaism is kneeling before Jesus, yearning for something more, more than just his wealth. He wants assurance of inheriting eternal life. Clear to the doing hasn't been enough. Did you catch that in his question? What must I do to inherit eternal life? The commandments with their do nots hadn't satisfied. Legalism, even if perfectly fulfilled, hasn't brought him spiritual satisfaction. One thing you lack. Jesus gazes at him there before him. Huh? 
who loves you. Perhaps the seeker is ready for relationship, not just religion. What's church about to you? Is it just a matter of outward conformity, showing up each week, going through the right motions? That's going to leave you hollow, a sham. You may seem to have it all together on the outside, like the rich young ruler, but would those closest to you say your faith is real? Is your prayer life like cardboard or non-existent? God sees you in your lack of fulfillment. He loves you. He, he wants you to experience Him so much more. Verse 12b, what's the good teacher's prescription? Go, sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Did Jesus just say what I think he said? Did he just tell a man who has everything, go, sell everything? One thing you lack. Just one more thing, and then, wham! Christ challenges our young would-be protege to move from legalism to loving and to show it by giving away all his stuff to the poor. You can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead, according to Jesus, that this guy sells his earthly possessions, he'll convert it directly to treasure in heaven, and be invited to follow Jesus. Here Christ is doing spiritual surgery, incising deep beneath the surface religiosity and conformity and looking good in the synagogue, to expose the man's real love affair with the world. Possessions are his idols. His commentator Robinson puts it, he worshipped money more than God when put to the test. Could that be true of us? Are we trusting in... Um, sorry. As we sit here today, we're likely in the top 1% of the world's wealthy or close to it. I mean, just... Uh, uh, chatting on Facebook Messenger yesterday with 30-something uh, uh, over in South Sudan, and she's setting up a discipleship school this week, and they've got bamboo they're setting up, and she's uh, sweating out 40-degree temperatures, but uh, she's talking with a young girl at the place where she's staying there, and the young girl said, why do you mean in Canada they have electricity all the time? This is stuff we take so much for granted. Where is our security? Are we trusting in our stuff to the point that if Jesus gave us a direct command to give it all away to the poor, like the young man in the story, our face would fall, we'd walk away sad? How tragic to be possessed by possessions and miss the opportunity to be with Jesus. Jesus expands upon the encounter with some no-holds-barred straight talk to the disciples, verses 23 to 26. How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed. Remember all that rabbinical teaching, that prosperity theology that said to be rich is to be blessed? Down the drain. The disciples were amazed, even more amazed, astonished, struck with amazement. Don't get hung up on or try to allegorize away the, the camel through the eye of the needle part. It's not about a special gate the camel had to kneel to go through. What sensible camel driver would put his beast through that? He'd just go use a bigger gate. There was already a Persian expression about an elephant and a needle. Jesus may have adapted it or used current expression or used his imagination. The point is the impossibility. How hard it is. Two times. Verse 27, with man this is impossible. Everybody say that, just impossible? Impossible. That's Jesus' point. Is a common expression today. We wouldn't talk about a camel in the eye of a needle. We would say, when pigs fly. In other words, it's just not a happening. Now, commentators are quick to open an escape hatch in case this makes those with possessions uncomfortable. For instance, in IV study Bible, there is no indication that Jesus' command to him was meant for all Christians. It applies only to those who have the same spiritual problem. 
let's not be too hasty to assume this need not apply to us. Jesus seems to be underlining something extremely important about the tempting power of men. God was getting at a similar heart matter back in Deuteronomy 8 when he warned the Israelites what might happen when they entered the promised land. He said, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant. What's the key issue here? Does our wealth seduce us to trust in it, become proud and complacent, rather than trusting in God who has given it to us? The other end of the Bible, Paul was very direct in counseling Timothy how he should exhort those who are better off. 1 Timothy 6. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. And the heart issues running through that, temptation, trap, harmful desires, love of money, eager for money, wandered from the faith, arrogant, put their hope in wealth, put their hope in God. Where is your hope? Winning the lottery, in your RRSP stash or multiple properties, the latest gadget, the newest vehicle in the showroom. What if Jesus were to ask you to put all that away? Could you do it for him? Is he your treasure? Have you consciously put all you have and are, all you ever, will ever own, at the disposal of his kingdom? Is your heart genuinely loving people over possessions? So you are, in Paul's words, rich in good deeds, generous, willing to share. In this way you will, as Paul continues, lay up treasure for yourself in the, for the coming age. Remember we were talking about that, you can send it on ahead. Lay up treasure for yourself for the coming age so that you may take hold of the life that is truly life. Or as Jesus phrased it, Give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. The disciples, in their amazement, as they pick themselves up off the floor, ask, Who then can be saved? As if to say, It was that hard for the rich to be saved. What hope is there for the rest of us? Verse 27, one of the most memorizable verses in the New Testament. Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Forget karma or fate as in Hinduism. Don't resign yourself to status quo because it is the will of Allah as in Islam. The God of the Bible makes the impossible possible. When you repent and break off your enchantment with this world's idols, he can save and transform you for eternity. It does require total surrender. This point is not lost on the disciples, for Peter points out in verse 28. We have left everything to follow you. Regularly and devotedly, we need to put all our possessions, our bank accounts, our property on the altar, as it were, and offer it all back to God to do with as He pleases. It's not ours, it's trust to be used for His glory, not our proud purposes or pleasure. In response, Jesus implies there is a real return on your investment. You know, these real return bonds they talk about these days. But there's a real return here, not 1% or 10% or 100%, but 10,000%. My calculations, right? You can correct me after if not. Verse 29 to 30, I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sister or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel 
will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, and with them, persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. Belonging to Jesus makes us part of a divine network, a, a faith family wherein we share what we have because we recognize it doesn't just belong to us, but is at the Master's disposal. As in Acts 4, it says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. There were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money for themselves, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. A hundred times as much, 10,000% along with persecutions. This uh, Relief and Development Sunday, we close with an opportunity to put Jesus' words into practice, to prove our heart is not captive to materialistic violence, but sharing what we have. We have an opportunity to help people in India build safe toilets where drinking water isn't contaminated. The young girls aren't raped in flimsy shelters, he'll explain that in a minute. An opportunity to drill wells, to provide bicycles for brothers in Nepal carrying the good news about Jesus to distant villages, to provide warm shoes for children in India seeking learning from our sister church folk. All things are possible with God. The wonderful God who invites us to follow Jesus, to, to know him in eternal life, and find treasure in heaven by giving to the poor. I'm right, going to bring the video. Rick, can you have the finger on the, the, the video on there just in case it's a bit better. In January 2012, President Phil Nassau and I were invited by partner Bruce in India and Nepal to come and see the good gospel work that they were doing. Indigenous gospel workers are doing an amazing job with the church. They've asked us to partner with them in some very practical ways, things like food and clothing, <coughs> supplementary education, and training of pastors to go out to the village churches. We think an investment in things like mind, heart, and body would be a great investment for us in these countries, especially in the youth. This year in particular, we hope to focus in on four material projects. The first one is called Shoes for Kids. President Phil and I went to a village called Bunga. There, the Christian school was doing supplementary education. The kids were coming to school, all excited about learning and growing in their experience, but we noticed that many of them came in flip-flops and sandals, and it was zero degrees. It was very cold. So this is a compassionate response to a need for a simple thing like shoes. This compassionate response uh, will help the pastors who are very committed people to have a new platform to work from to share the gospel. Our second project is called Bicycles for Pastors. In Nepal, Ted Roca, the president of our sister churches, introduced us to an extensive village ministry. These pastors are a very committed group of young people who travel from village to village. And a bicycle in their hands would be a tremendous asset to their ministry. Our goal for this project is to send 25 bicycles for the next four years, making 100 bicycles for just under $4,000. Our third project is safe drinking water. In six villages outside of Kolkata, there is no well and no safe drinking water. They use surface water to cook, clean, bathe, everything. Pastor Aziz is the pastor of these seven villages. He's a good friend of David Benjamin from our Center Street Church. What he would like to do is put one well in each of those villages so that he can bring safe, clean drinking water and improved health in those places. He thinks that those primary Hindu communities would respond to the gospel if they really cared enough that we gave them clean water. Our fourth project is sanitation in these same villages in India. The need for safe toilets and for uh, good hygiene is very important in these villages. Parents of young girls in these villages are very concerned about their daughters. Uh, the increased sexual attacks are taking place as these women use open throat toilets. Esther Aziz has come up with a new, safe, concrete toilet with a holding tank. For just over $300, that toilet can be built. His estimate is that there will be a need for 60 of those. The young people at Pigeon Praise 2012 raised enough money this year to build 30 of those toilets. 
You can find descriptions of these projects on our EMCC website. See how these projects will help the church in Nepal and India be effective, strong, and relevant for future generations. Our prayer is perfect together with brothers and sisters in India and Nepal that we be able to sing with the psalmist. Then our sons and their youth will be like well-nutrient plants, and our daughters will be like pillars carved to adorn a palace. I want to encourage you to give generously on this Relief and Development Sunday so that we might invest and enrich the future generations of India and Nepal.